Hello and welcome to this network education video. My name is Russell DeLong and this is the EPS Architecture Overview. This video seeks to cover terminology clarifications for 4G LTE and the EPS, that is the Evolved Packet System. An overview of each component of the Evolved Packet System and an overview of each of the connections between those components. So really we're going to be talking about uh, the Evolve Packet System, that is really the network that people refer to as 4G LTE, all the blocks uh, that can be broken up into and how those blocks interact uh, to make data sessions and voice calls happen. So I wanted to start with terminology clarifications because this is often a point of confusion even within engineering uh, circles. Uh, so 3GPP is the, is the third generation partnership project it all starts with them. They are a standardization body that define mobile networks. So really they would write the white papers and the definitions of all the protocols that are used between systems in the Evolve Packet system. They would define the different, the different building blocks of the system. They would define how they're supposed to talk to each other and how the whole thing holistically is supposed to work. That includes both the radio as well as the core network architecture. So they work on annual releases. In this case, we're talking about release 8, because we're talking about the Evolve Packet system and where it was defined. But you can go down in previous generations, so release 7, release 6, release 5, and then forwards, release 9 through 10, 11, 12. And, and they will add to the existing architecture in most cases. Release 8 was really a dividing line between uh, what's loosely referred to as the third generation and what's loosely referred to as the fourth generation. So on the radio side, moving from uh, CDMA and Wideband Code Division Multiple Access, WCDMA, uh, towards uh, Frequency Division, FDMA, on the radio side. And then on the core side, moving from a telephone network that was built to allow for some data after the fact towards an all IP network that was built to support converged voice, video, and data services over one common architecture. So in this release, they broke it down into two separate projects, one focusing on the radio and the needs and evolution that needed to happen in the radio network, and the other in the core network. So the radio side was the long-term evolution work effort or project, for lack of a better term. And on the core side was the system architecture evolution, or the SAE, the evolution of the core network architecture. Those two projects produced as output the Evolved UMTS Terrestrial Radio Access Network, or the EUTRAN, the LTE Radio Network, and the EPC, or the Evolved Packet Core, which was the core network defined as part of the SAE project, the System Architecture Evolution Work Effort. Now, these are two independent systems which come together to form the Evolved Packet System. So from the user through the radio network, through the Evolve Packet Core towards a destination IP network. That whole end-to-end -end architecture is the Evolved Packet System, or the EPS. Now, in my view, the EPS is really the term that should be mainstream to, for a device to support EPS connectivity uh, via the LTE radio. Uh, LTE just seems to be the term that get caught on. Uh, you'll even hear the terms like LTE Core to refer to the EPC. Uh, but that's really technically incorrect. This is the way that it is at least intended to be broken down. Uh, EU train and EPC coming together to form EPS as the overall end-to-end -end technology. So the EPS architecture goes something like this. Uh, first of all, don't be too overwhelmed if you're looking at this diagram and, and realizing you don't understand any of these acronyms. Uh, if you're anything like me, you, you get excited when you see that because it's an opportunity to learn. Uh, but but really, a lot of these are simpler than they appear. So UE is really just a user equipment that's basically your cell phone in most contexts. Enode B is really a cell tower. And then these boxes, HSS, MME, S-Gateway, and P-Gateway, we're going to be talking about these a lot, but they make up really the, the base setup of the Evolve Packet Core, and that is going to be the focus of this video series. And then again, end-to-end -end connectivity, the EPS, or the Evolved Packet System, uh, when the, for, to facilitate the subscriber going through the radio network, going through the core, 
EUTRAN plus EPC equals the EPS. So the UE, user equipment, refers to the device controlled by the user of the wireless network. Again, you'll often hear acronyms applied to things that are, are very common and everyday, uh, like a, a cell phone or really, as the network is evolving, you see more USB dongles or tablets or data sticks. It's not always necessarily a phone anymore. It's really a device or user equipment. Um, Aside from just being your phone, a LTE UE must support the 3GP procedures and call flows required of such a device. So just as the 3GPP defines what the core network should do and what the cell tower should do, it also defines expected procedures and behaviors of devices. Uh, some uh, specifications will draw a distinction between a UE and a SIM. A SIM is the, is the well, if you've, if you've used cell phones, all you, you should know what a SIM card is. It's a, it's a small card that goes into the phone that's given to you by an operator, and it's used to authenticate you towards that operator's network. So sometimes the distinction will be drawn between the UE and the SIM card, and further a distinction can be drawn uh, between the SIM card, uh, really the application that it's running, and the hardware. So sometimes the hardware, the physical SIM card itself, will be referred to as a UICC, a Universal Integrated Circuit Card, I believe, and the USIM, which is really just the name of the SIM application or software on the card. Uh, usually, I, I would say most specs don't draw those distinctions, but if you're looking especially at a device spec, uh, they will use that terminology. The IMSI number is a unique identifier for the SIM card, while the IMEI is the unique number, uh, unique identifier for the physical device. IMSI stands for International Mobile Subscriber Identifier. IMEI stands for International Mobile Equipment Identifier. So the S is subscriber. That maps to the SIM card. A SIM card is used to track a subscriber, and IMEI is used to track a physical phone or a device. E node B, or evolved node B, basically this is the formal name for an LTE cell tower. Again, sort of a long acronym for something that's, that's relatively simple to understand in concept. It provides radio access to the UE, and I'm drawing, I'm, I'm referring to them as, as interfaces here. Uh, we're going to talk about these more in detail in upcoming videos, but an interface in this terminology, it refers to a logical connection between two endpoints. So if you go back to this uh, EPS architecture, UE talking to an E node B, well, there would be a defined interface for that, which is UU. There will be, and then depending on, on the interface, different la la layers might be defined for it. So for example, a connection, this S6A interface between an MME and an HSS, well, it would define the whole protocol stack for that. So it's got to be over IP, IPv4, IPv6, and the transport layer, uh, if, you, if you're familiar with, with the OSI model, the transport layer protocol will be SCTP, and the application layer would be diameter, and then here's all the messages that have to happen between them. All of that definition would fall under the reference point or interface that is called S6A. So if you were to look up S6A, you would get the definition for what communication is happening between what two endpoints. So I just I added them in here uh, just because that's that's kind of the terminology of the industry, just to sort of to gradually get people used to it if they're if they're watching this for the first time. Uh, tunnels control. Yeah, so sorry, a tunnels control traffic between the user and the network, so S1 MME interface, and data. So an important concept, uh, not just for the EPS, but for mobile networks in general, is the separation of user plane and control. Uh, that's the terminology. So to go back to this architecture, if you are trying to register with the network and say, hey, I'm here, I want to have a session, I want to create a session. Uh, here, I'll, I'll clean this up a bit. Sorry. So if you wanted to just create a data session, you would send it this way. And if you wanted to send packets towards your destination network, you would send it this way. So there's a separation between control, which I've drawn in red, which is a session setup, session maintenance, and session teardown with the actual forwarding of user plane packets towards, let's say, the internet, for lack of a better example, uh, which would be user plane. Uh, 
All right, and then, uh, yeah, the Enode B tunnels, con so control traffic towards the MME, and it tunnels data traffic from the user towards the S gateway, or the serving gateway. Uh, and it also talks to other Enode Bs. So again, to, I'll go back, we'll be going back to this diagram throughout the course of this video series, I suspect, because it really is exactly what it is that we're talking about. Um, so if the UE moves, that X2 connection I was just referencing, if you had a second eNodeB, obviously a network isn't going to just have one cell tower, typically. So if you had a second eNodeB connecting something like this, just as I've drawn S1 MME and S1U, I could draw X2 here, the link between an eNodeB and another eNodeB. So if the UE moved here and started talking to this eNodeB, he can sort of reestablish his data session from this eNodeB to the serving gateway onwards. And then that X2 interface would be the eNodeBs talking to each other to hand over user packets uh, seamlessly, or as seamlessly as possible. Uh, and I write that because it is a difference from older architectures where the cell towers could not talk directly to each other. They had to talk to something called a radio network controller or a base station controller as in a hub and spoke model where you have one or, or potentially two uh, hubs. That everything had to talk to it and then it could talk to the other sites. So a, a, a cell tower would talk to an RNC, an RNC would talk to the second cell tower if they needed to talk to each other. It was never direct. Whereas with the evolved packet system and the evolved UTRAN, the evolved UMTS terrestrial radio access network, the new radio access network, uh, it is able to talk, to, the sites are able to talk directly to each other. MME uh, is Mobility Management Entity. So the MME, as we said in this diagram, it's control traffic that goes from the user to the MME. The MME really keeps track of the user's state in the network. Whether the user, if the user has turned his phone off, the MME would eventually time out. He's expecting keep alive messages from the user. He'd eventually time it out, and he'd be the one to say, "Okay, this session's gone now. The subscriber is, has disappeared," and the MME would be the one to tear down that session. Uh, if you're setting up a new session, you would request a session setup with the MME. The user would, the UE would, and the MME would be the one maintaining the session. So, keeps track of users that are registered on the network. Acts as a gatekeeper, handling user requests for network access, setting up and tearing down data sessions. Authorization and authentication. So the MME will talk to the HSS to get security information. So if this subscriber needs to be authenticated and, and traffic needs to be encrypted, the MME will ask the HSS for what security, key, security keys are in play for the subscriber so that he can authenticate the user, so that the user can authenticate the network as well, and that they can set up encryption. Uh, he also authorizes the subscriber. So the MME will send a similar query to the HSS, which is really, you can almost think of it as a radio server or an AAA server. That's, that's what it functionally is doing here. The MME can query the HSS and say, well, what, what services is the subscriber provision for? And the HSS will say what networks he's allowed to reach, what quality of service he should receive, what bandwidth, what data rates he should be able to get. All of that happens here, and the MME will keep track of all of that. The MME selects what serving and PDN, or S and P, gateways will be used for a given data session. So really, the, the, the actual data itself, again, is going to be going from the user like this. That's the path of user packets. Well, it's the MME who's going to be deciding what S gateway to select, what P gateway to select. Uh, so he could point in potentially another serving gateway or another PDN gateway. And it's going to be the MME who's dictating that. And primary responsibilities can be divided uh, into EMM and ESM, mobility management and session management. Uh, this is for the most part, the same, or at least very similar to previous architectures. You will hear uh, this term MM, mobility management, used usually for circuit switch networks. And GMM, or GPS, uh, GPRS, mobility management, referred to for, for, for thir third generation uh, data architectures. And then E for evolved mobility management in the case of the evolved packet system. And ESM, similarly, uh, evolved session management as opposed to just normal session management. Uh, ESM, uh, we're going to talk about the distinction between these and how they work in a dedicated video uh, for mobility management. 
Uh, but that's sort of the, how the responsibilities of the MME can be broken down. Uh, creating an actual data session, ESM, and making sure you know uh, where the subscriber is and, uh, and their state in the network would be EMM, Mobility Management. Uh, a user can be registered with or located on only one MME at a time. So if the user were to move to a second carrier or if the user were to move uh, even within the, the same carrier's network to an area that's not served by that given MME, uh, he would register with a new MME and the new MME would uh, eventually end up uh, disconnecting the, the uh, registration with the original MME. HSS Home Subscriber Server acts as a common database of subscriber information that can be queried by MMEs to determine permitted services. We talked about that a little bit there. You can almost think of it like if, if, you're, if your background is in enterprise networking, you can almost think of an HSS as your radius server. Uh, if you're setting up a VPN connection and you're trying to authenticate users coming into a VPN gateway, well, the HSS is the guy who would say, here's the subscriber, here's his security details, here's his, his key information, and here's what he's supposed to be able to do. Uh, so authentication and authorization will be done by the HSS. Uh, it holds the primary security key. We talked about that. It also, uh, for a location, it keeps a bird's eye view of what subscribers are located where, or rather what MMEs are serving what subscribers at a given time. So to go back to this architecture, if this was a very, very large uh, network, if you had, say, two dozen different MMEs and you're trying to track down a single subscriber, and he might even be roaming in some other carrier's MME, well, the HSS, your common subscriber database, uh, would keep a record of what MME was last, last declared itself to be the registered or the located MME for that subscriber. So the flow would be go to the HSS, query it, and say, okay, he's an MME number seven in my network. I would then go to MME number seven, and I would know to query him, and he would have the most current state information for that given subscriber. So S gateway, serving gateway. Uh, one or more serving gateways will serve a given group of cell sites or enodes for user plane data. Uh, a, U a single UE can be served by only one serving gateway at a time. Uh, this can be a uh, significant theory, and I'll talk about the difference between that and the P gateway. Uh, so in the Evolve Packet system, if you're a single user trying to reach multiple PDNs, so if you have the internet, you've got a, a voice over IP network, you've got an internal corporate network uh, called the corporate APM, where you're trying to reach a specific corporate entity, uh, three different destination networks, you could potentially be served by three different PDN gateways, not necessarily, but one PDN gateway might not be able to reach all the external IP networks that you're trying to reach. So you might end up with two or three different PDN gateways if you're simultaneously trying to establish data sessions with different IP networks, but you would still be on the same S gateway. So the way to kind of look at it as the serving gateway anchors the user. The PDN gateway anchors the PDN. Now that's kind of the way to look at it. You, a, a, a subscriber is, is served by only a single S gateway. He can reach all the different PDN gateways he wants to to reach different PDNs, as dictated by the MME, which we'll get into uh, for the LTE session setup call flow uh, video that's coming up. But PDN gateways, again, can serve multiple, one or more PDNs. Uh, let's see here. Receives instruction from the MME to set up and tear down sessions for a UE. Acts as a middleman for signaling between the P gateway and the MME. So when the MME tries to set up a data session, he'll talk to the S gateway. You'll notice there's no interface between the MME and the P gateway. The MME will tell the S gateway what P gateway to talk to, and he'll give him his IP address and say, hey, talk to this guy. Uh, it handles uh, user IP packets between the P gateway and the eNodeB, and functionally the NS gateway is an IP router uh, with support for mobile-specific uh, GTP tunneling protocol as well as some charging functionality. So you can go back to this architecture again, and because this is all just user plane IP packets that are being forwarded between these boxes and an external network like the Internet, really the S gateway and P gateway, their main functionalities are that of packet forwarding. They're basically IP routers. Uh, they need to support GPRS tunneling protocol or GTP 
That's that signaling between the MME and the S gateway, and the signaling between S gateway and P gateway. It's also, it's, it's a tunneling protocol, so what it's really doing is setting up a tunnel, almost like a GRE tunnel, if you're familiar with that, the same sort of concept between the user all the way up to the P gateway, where the IP gateway of the subscriber, if you're trying to map this to like a wireless LAN, your IP gateway is the PDN gateway. In fact, we also have the same similar concept to an SSID. Uh, you can almost look at it as a pointer towards an extern to an IP network you're trying to reach. And that SSID uh, analogy is kind of like an APN or an access point name, a pointer for a given IP network that you're trying to reach. And the PDN gateway would be your IP gateway reaching that PDN. Whereas the S gateway is really just transparently tunneling you. All right, so P gateway, also known as the PCEF. I know this is a lot of acronyms in one video to go over, uh, but the PCEF, or the Policy Control Enforcement Function, is another name for the P gateway, or another responsibility for the P gateway, I should say. Uh, and it is responsible for dictating quality of service and bandwidth parameters for the subscriber's session. So as I mentioned in the EPS architecture, the HSS is authorizing what services the user can have as well as quality of service. Really all he's doing though is influencing what the MME will request of the P gateway. The P gateway is the dictator because the P gateway is in a unique position really to make the call as to what quality of service he should have. P gateway can talk to a policy control rules function, a policy control server that's dedicated for just saying what QoS a subscriber should have potentially. He also has billing functionality. So he can talk to a billing server and say, well, does the subscriber have balance to even allow any session to go through? Or maybe he's only allowed to go to this other service that has lower QoS because of some time-based parameter. Like maybe at 2 o'clock we want to have, have a lower QoS if there's a busy hour or something. So P-Gateway can talk to a few different sources that an enemy doesn't have any defined connections to. So really just the P-Gateway is in the better position to make the call as to what the quality of service should be. And he is the dictator of that. And again, functionally, the P gateway is an IP router uh, with support for few mobile specific uh, protocols. Diameter would be one. GTP would be another. Those are really the big two that a router would need to support in order to be a P gateway. Uh, so the EPS, this is just to illustrate the separation of control and user plane uh, interfaces. So the UU interface has both a user and control component towards the enode B. I don't want to get too much into the radio side, but if you're if you're a radio person, uh, Radio Resource Control or RRC, that will be the radio channel uh, for this red uh, line here. And then you get your user plane uh, radio channels uh, for your radio bearer or your RB between the UE and the ENOD B. I don't worry about too much about that for this course. Uh, the focus, uh, if it's not already clear, the focus of this course is going to really be the Evolve Packet Core and its interactions with the radio network and with external networks. Uh, I am not a radio uh, expert. I'm not a major authority on the radio side. So for the EU TRAN, uh, I'm definitely this interface here. I'm not going to touch on in a great amount of detail, this UU interface, the actual radio. Uh, the EPS, oh, sorry, I'm a little bit sidetracked. But yeah, so all the reds are control. All the greens are a user plane. And then boxes that do both E node B and the, e, and the UE, I just drew them as white here. And going into a roaming scenario, <laughs> it's almost exactly the same thing. This is sort of a joke that I, I even put this in here, but S8 is really the only difference is between an S gateway and a P gateway, uh, the term is S8 as opposed to uh, S5 between a home serving gateway and a home PDN gateway. Uh, but this actually here, Typical roaming scenario, this would be the operational ownership boundaries. So if you are a subscriber, you're subscriber A, and you belong to or have a contract and have a, a SIM card of operator A, this is how it would typically break down if you're roaming. So if you're in another operator's radio network, you're connecting to the cell site of operator B, uh, it would be the E node B of operator B, connecting to the MME of operator B and the S gateway of operator B. You would then have the S gateway talking to the P gateway of operator A. And the MME would be talking to the HSS of operator A. 
So from a troubleshooting perspective, if you're trying to trace some problem with this subscriber, this UE, well, if you're operator A, you've got the HSS. You could say what MME he's last registered on, which would be that of operator B. Unlikely that you can actually access operator B or get uh, like Wireshark traces or anything between the MME and Enid B or anything like that. You're kind of in the dark in this respect. And P Gateway, you might have access to billing, you might have access to policy control, and you might have access to P Gateway. You could even potentially, if this scenario is, is a, a VoIP call, if this is an IMS network, this PDN, you could potentially troubleshoot it at the IMS level if uh, everything else in operator B was working correctly. And again, if you're operator B, you'd only have access to everything in this box here. So you'd have access to the radio side, the MME, and the S gateway. Uh, so your, your boundaries are really here. So if you're operator B, well, am I sending a create session request? And we'll talk about the individual messages in other videos, but if I am, am I sending a session request to operator A? Yes or no. So if I am, am I getting a rejection? Okay, it's operator A's problem. Or on this side, MME, am I querying their HSS? Am I getting a response? Yes, I am, but it's a rejection because this subscriber is barred. Okay, so it's a provisioning problem in operator A. So that's sort of how you can approach the troubleshooting. Uh, understanding these two interfaces, the, the messages that are supposed to be taking place, whether they are or not, and whether they're succeeding, uh, can, can really be the differentiator as to where the problem lies, if it's an operator A problem, if this isn't working, or if it's an operator B problem. And similarly, I'll just go back to this other one because it's already a clean diagram, uh, between the radio group and the network group, I mean, most likely, and I don't know your operational structure, but most likely, this might be one group, but most likely, this is going to be a different group. Because this is the radio. Typically, you wouldn't have the RF uh, supported by the same people that are supporting all the signaling in the EPC. So if you needed to troubleshoot a problem where they're saying, well, no, this is the radio, well, no, this is the core, one of the most important interfaces to look at is this S1 MME interface. Because really, the Evolve Packet Core, its job doesn't start until a subscriber tries to connect to it. And if you don't see any, uh, the protocol would be NAS, non-access stratum, the messages between the user and the MME. If you see no NAS messages happening on this interface at all, nothing's coming to the MME, then it's not an MME problem. It might be a problem with whatever IP infrastructure you have here between the enode B and the MME. Might be a problem with the enode B. Might be a radio problem. The device isn't sending the request. Might be a device problem if, again, the device just for whatever reason isn't sending the request. Might be misconfigured or whatever else. So this is really a good way or a good interface to look at to say this is a device problem, this is a radio problem, or this is, or I should say this is a device or radio problem, or I am getting the message and I'm rejecting it. Okay, now we need to look further on the core side. Historical context. I just wanted to mention this briefly because even though the focus of this course is not going to be on a GPRS architecture, which is drawn below, uh, a lot of this terminology is still used in the industry even as it relates to LTE. You will hear the term MS or mobile station used to refer to UEs very often, and that is how they map out. Really, the 3GPP every once in a while will rebrand, <laughs> will rebrand some of the terms. So MS, Mobile Station, became UE in Release 8 onwards. The Node B became the Evolved Node B, or the E Node B. And how has it evolved? Well, it evolved really by taking over the functionality of the RNC. This gets misunderstood sometimes. So really, like I mentioned earlier, in older architectures, the node Bs couldn't talk to each other. They would always talk to an RNC on behalf of each other. Well, and sorry, and have the RNC route all the traffic to the destination node B. Well, in the Evolve Packet system, the E node Bs, the cell towers, can talk directly to each other. They can dynamically even learn about each other and set up relationships with each other uh, for handing over user packets. So they that evolved intelligence has kind of replaced the functionality of the RNC. Sometimes people will, will sort of look at it and say that the MME is the new RNC because it's a system that always has a connection to all the, to the cell site, uh, but that, that's not the case. It's really that the sites are now directly talking to core instead of talking to an RNC as an intermediary. Uh, and when I say always talking to, 
Uh, this S Gateway connection, this green, it's only created on demand when subscribers are actually talking to that S Gateway. That this uh, GTP tunnel would actually be what it is. Whereas this S1MME interface, once you configure the ENB, is always talking. Like this S1MME interface is an SCTP association that is always on uh, by design because you always need to have control traffic between the ENB and the MME. Or the ability to set up calls, which means you always have, need the ability to actually talk to an MME in order for an ENB to be able to work or serve any subscribers. So the SGSN, this is another one that sometimes gets misunderstood. As you'll see here, um, the separation of green and red, there was a lot less separation in the older architectures. Like almost every node is doing both jobs. Uh, but in for the SGSN, they broke this up into two components. So they said, well, the SGSN right now is responsible for session management. He's responsible for mobility management. And he's responsible for forwarding user plane packets. So they said, well, let's get let's take that packet forwarding part out of it the serving gateway part of it and make it the serving gateway. SGSEN stands for serving GPRS support node by the way but he's really just an IP router that had a lot of mobility management functions and they took all of his mobility management functions and his session management functions and they brought it over to the MME or the mobility management entity. So the SGSN got split in two and the GGSN, the, G, the gateway GPRS support node this is probably the most direct mapping. The Gateway GPRS support node became known as the P-Gateway. Uh, not a whole lot changed. I mean, support for newer GTP version, uh, but really, like, 99% the same job that he had in older architectures, the P-Gateway from the GGSN. HLR, Home Location Register, really the subscriber database, just like the HSS is in the newer architecture. So a subscriber will be located on an SGSN from an HLR. So you could go into an HLR and he would say last located for his GPRS sessions on this SGSN. You can go into that serving GSN. Just like in LTE, the HSS would keep track of the last registered, the last located MME serving a given subscriber. HLR would have security key information and everything else just like the HSS does. So very a, a pretty good direct mapping uh, drawn here. I didn't drop PDN over here, but it's the same thing. So GGSN would connect to an external IP network that the subscriber is trying to reach. And that really is all I wanted to go over you in this initial overview video. Uh, if you're feeling overwhelmed, uh, don't worry. I will be going over all of this uh, bit by bit as the course progresses. Uh, for now, though, thank you for watching, and uh, you can proceed on to the next.